a very warm welcome to uh, all of our um, compliance community around the world for what is the second LinkedIn Live special. Uh, my name is James Rickett. I'm the global lead for anti-money laundering and sanctions compliance. And I'm delighted to be joined once again by Tim Tyler, Vice President here at the International Compliance Association, where we're gonna be talking about criminal asset recovery. Why so small? Now, not only is Tim uh, our vice president here at the ICA, but there is no better individual I could think of to talk about criminal asset recovery from somebody that's been in the trenches, Tim, looking at criminal asset recovery. Um, as always, please engage uh, with us through the chat functionality. Following this, we hope to record a follow-up event exclusive for ICA members, and we'll listen to your comments and talk about some of the issues. But look, Tim, I'm not gonna waste any more time. Let's dive into the topic. Give us the scene. Set the scene on criminal asset recovery and if it's working. So I think a good place to start is to recognise that this is politically a very strong move. And we've seen successive governments investing in what is a very strong message, taking assets away from criminals and reinvesting those assets in the communities that those criminals have harmed. Why wouldn't governments want to do this? And if we go back to Proceeds of Crime Act in 2002 for the United Kingdom, uh, we've seen that strong legislative em emphasis, and that's replicated in other parts of the world as well. And again, just looking at what's happened in the UK, um, we've seen the Asset Recovery Agency. The government sought to incentivize law enforcement and prosecution authorities to get involved in asset recovery by giving them, returning a proportion of the assets that are recovered to the agencies that are able to achieve this. We've seen more and more investment in this space. And yet, and this is the point, and yet the level of asset recovery is tiny. I often will ask colleagues, maybe in classes and, and similar, what would you expect to be a reasonable level of asset recovery? And I'd, I'd, I'd invite people now as, as they're tuned in, what would you expect governments to achieve in terms of asset recovery? Would it be 80% probably unrealistic. Would it be 50%? Mm, probably unrealistic. But then we come down to 20 or 10 or even 1%. And the reality is, no, it's something like 0.2% according to UN figures. I did some work a little while ago um, and I interrogated figures that came from the UK Audit Office and I compared them for asset recovery and I compared them with the size of the estimated or the estimated size of the criminal economy in the UK. Um, the figures I came up with were 0.18% wow. in terms of asset recovery. So. I think there's a fairly compelling argument to say that there's a lot of good intention here, but it's not being translated to meaningful impact. The expense, of course, is huge, isn't it? Not just even from the day-to-day uh, -day level, and you look at the, the UK financial services sector, it's estimated that compliance costs about £22,000 an hour, and that's data provided by the UK finance. Moving up at a governmental level and law enforcement level, the costs are even greater. So it can be quite hard not to feel a little bit disappointed when you hear those numbers. Nonetheless, um, we need to understand the why. So why, in your opinion, Tim, do you think it's not working? Well, there are lots of reasons. Um, I think it's useful to isolate four. The, the first is that if you look at the UK, and I think, again, this can be replicated in other parts of the world, but if we look at the UK, our courts, our prosecution and to a certain extent, our law enforcement capabilities are developed, are built around criminal justice outcomes that focus on the individual, that don't focus on the assets. So we're very used to putting criminals into prison. The idea of taking away their assets mm. is problematic. And I've seen, and although the situation has improved over the years, courts have been reluctant to do this because it's kind of not within their bailiwick. Yes, there is the legal framework to encourage them to do it, but there isn't the culture, there isn't the history that gives them the confidence to do that. A second reason, I think, is around resourcing. Um, police, prosecution, courts, other agencies that are involved in this 
um, historically. Um, arguably, they're under-resourced in terms of the proportion of organizations that are devoted to recovering assets. Police and crime commissioners have other goals. They have other objectives. They are accountable to the public. And very often, the public aren't concerned about things like asset recovery. It seems too distant, too remote. Yeah. So there isn't the incentive to invest in this. Um, thirdly, my experience of criminals is they will do anything but give their assets up. So they fight and fight, and they will take every possible legal recourse. There, there is often a sort of acceptance um, that if they have to go to prison, well, you know, ultimately they'll go to prison. They kind of see that arguably as uh, a risk of operating in this business, but don't take away their assets. That's something that they will fight and fight for. But there are three, I think, useful pointers. But I think for me that the greatest, the most significant reason is the complexity of our financial system. That's a very interesting thought. Um, uh, going to prison is just an occupational hazard. And actually, if you think about investigations within financial institutions that lead to intelligence with financial intelligence units, um, fundamentally, this is about people. And not, and not the asset. In a in a little while, Tim, I know we're very pressed for time and there's so much to unpack. We might talk about how AML professionals can help and maybe that is processes such as things like CDD. Um, however, it would be, uh, we'd be doing a disservice to our viewers if we didn't lean on your experiences of asset recovery. I'd be really keen to hear um, from your experience some of the challenges that you faced when it comes to asset recovery, cases you've worked on and the obstacles that you've you've had to overcome. Well, thank you for the question. I, I, I suppose I ought to say it's been some years um, since I was involved. Um, I headed up the Proceeds of Crime Operational Command within what's now the National Crime Agency, and I was involved in asset recovery and countering money laundering. So this was a few years ago, but I think the principles hold. And what I saw was that every case is unique. So. Um, each one will present its own particular challenges. And that's significant because it means that we can't industrialize our approach. We can't deal with volume asset recovery cases as easily as it might sound because they all twist and turn. Um, I can give you an example of a case and maybe that illustrates the complexity and the level of challenge that it involves. But it will be a unique case, and the next one is likely to present a different set of challenges. Yeah. But this this case, um, we were speaking about it before, um, it involves partnership uh, between a number of countries around the world. In fact, seven jurisdictions were working together to counter a particular money laundering network uh, that was hosted in a Middle Eastern country. Um, and one of our partners was the FBI, and we were working quite closely with them, developing intelligence around this network. And along the way, we identified $5.6 million in New York that the FBI were able to move against. Um, it was seized, and it led to a range of different legal maneuvers and activities um, in order to recover those funds. It was my team that were doing much of the work for the FBI. They were drafting the affidavits um, and the other instruments that were used in recovering those assets. Um, and even before we got to that, it was only because we were collaborating across so many different jurisdictions that we were able to identify the assets and take steps to secure them. What it eventually led to was the recovery of those funds, which stayed in America, uh, which, as the footnote, we did much of the work around this. Um, but as we expected, they, they stayed within America and they were, they were added to the Treasury coffers. Uh, that's just one example. In that particular case, it involved cross-border issues, it involved collaboration, it involved partnership arrangements where we were doing much of the technical work. The next case, as I say, it will be a different set of challenges. 
There are some uh, really useful case studies about this, um, particularly to our viewers that they can go and research this. Um, a case which I speak about quite regularly in the diploma and anti-money laundering workshops is that of Altaf Kanani. Altaf Kanani was a pro uh, very infamous, I think the right word to use is, money launderer based out of the UAE that involved international efforts to trace assets. Uh, and if you look on YouTube and look for the billion dollar bust, you'll almost be able to visualize some of the efforts that Tim and his team went through at the time uh, on a global network on how we collaborate with that. Now, the case of Altaf Kanani was not without the help of the regulated sector. And we have many AML and compliance professionals watching Tim. And I think what would be useful is it may be a takeaway to think about as an AML or a financial crime professional, um, how can we help in the recovery of assets? Again, we spoke about this before, and we bring a different perspective to this because, of course, James, you worked at the front line leading teams within a global bank in investigating suspicious activity and identifying illegal assets. My perspective was at the other end of the telescope yeah. around that activity. And I think that illustrates one of the things that we need to do, and that is, as far as possible, work collaboratively. Yes, there are restrictions, and rightly there are restrictions around how we can do that, around data protection, for instance, um, and around client confidentiality, um, and local laws, depending on where we're operating. Yeah. But as far as we are uh, legislatively able to, we need to find ways to collaborate, to work together, to not just target offenders, and that's the difference, yeah. not just target offenders, but look at the assets, the flow of the assets, and where we can best in, take steps to lock them down. But to come to your question, um, what can we as compliance professionals do? Well, I think the first thing is not to be discouraged, which might sound a little bit strange because we started this conversation recognizing tiny amounts. Yeah. The reality is that criminals are keeping 99.8% of their illegal proceeds. Um, and that could demoralize us, leave us thinking, well, really, what's the point? But if that number is to grow, and I'm confident that it will, yeah. then it will be in large part because of activity within financial services, within the compliance community. And we will see that changing and evolving, I expect. Maybe we'll come on to talk about that in the subsequent video, I think, that we've yep. shared. Um, but in the short term, there's an opportunity to do our due diligence effectively, to understand source of funds, source of wealth, so that if there is a subsequent police investigation, for instance, we have answers. It's important to record why we're making decisions so we have clarity in our thinking. And that's particularly important when we're involving complex products, cryptocurrencies, or um, offshore or other assets or trusts yeah. that we know historically have been used by money launderers or trade. For yeah. that matter. And we know there is a huge global spotlight at the moment on things like offshore entities, yeah. trust corporate. So the, the mood music is we're going in the right direction. Very much so. And, and maybe if I just add a, a final point, and as we come into the last few minutes, I might ask for your perspective on a silver lining to all of this. You know, CDD should never be underestimated, knowing who our customers are. And maybe this is a mindset change. This is, and, we, and I must recognize that we are seeing this. Many large institutions now are rewarding their staff for good due diligence, uh, which is positive. Having a strong whistleblowing policy, showing people it's okay to do the right thing and there are mechanisms uh, to do this. So Tim, we're in our last 60 seconds and we did predict that this would go by very quick. So despite the low rates of asset recovery, should we remain hopeful? We should. And as I mentioned before, where there is an answer, it will come from in part within financial services and we can positively contribute to that. Doing our jobs, our individual jobs, whatever they are, whether they're in customer due diligence, enhanced due diligence, whether they're an investigative or an advisory capacity, doing what we do and doing it well will better facilitate this, whether it's the conviction of offenders, the recovery of assets, or simply locking money launderers out of the system as best that we can. 
Tim, we've, we've run out of time, which is unexpected. Um, my sincere thanks to you and my sincere thanks to everybody for taking out time from your valuable day to join us. Please get some comments in the LinkedIn chat. Uh, Tim and I are going to record a follow-up video in the, in the minutes after this, so we'll take into consideration some of those comments. Thank you for joining us and I'll see you next time.